Welcome back to a Celtic state of mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and it is Easter Sunday. Happy Easter to you, Kevin McCluskey over in Budapest and to everybody else who is tuning in all over the globe to get your weekend fix of Celtic chat. Now, Kev, I'm obviously in a Easter egg coma at the moment because I've got a wee guy in the house. And, you know, it'd be rude if I didn't part participate in uh, everything that you do at Easter time. Is it different over in Hungary? Did it do anything a wee bit weird or wonderful over there? Um, I don't you want to tell us. You, you get involved, but I you know, don't want to I, mention I, it. I can tell. I, I can tell. I'll, I'll share all the dirty secrets. It's fine. There's nothing that's uh, <laughs> nothing that can't be broadcast at this time of the afternoon. But uh, first of all, I'll give you a Happy New Year. And in Hungarian, this is one of the ones I do know, Kelemes Kusveti. So, Happy New Year to you. It sound like a Bond um, villain when you do that. Kev, you've got to, you've got, you've got to make the accent a wee bit thicker. As long as you don't go full Joey Barton and put on that French accent that he did, you're all right. Uh, I think it's Eric Dyer not started doing that in German. I'm sure he's done it as well. I'm sure he has. He has. I've seen one of the interviews where he does it, and it's total cringeworthy. So I'm not quite at those levels just yet. I'll get there. I'm not quite there. Um, but yeah, no, Easter's a fairly big thing here. Quite a it's a family event, obviously. They do have the eggs, but it's not quite the same tradition that we do. But I'll make sure there's always an Easter egg hunt in the house. Hide some chocolate eggs someplace and let the girls go and find them. Uh, but the thing that they do is, and it's on uh, Easter Monday, is the, the the men, the boys of the village will go around to the girls. I think they have to present them with something, a gift, sing a song, do something. I'm not quite sure what it is. Uh, and then they water the girls, put water in their heads and it's to signify spring and new life and growth and all that. And then they get a beer back if they're old enough for it. So It sounds all a bit like Wicker Man, Kev. So send us footage, because that sounds all a <laughs> bit like dancing around fires. I mean, you don't see any... It's, it's a bit happy and all that, but you know. <laughs> it does, but you don't see any kind of strange behaviour behind the scenes in Scottish society at all, do you? Any of this secretive behaviour? Listen, before we went, <laughs> before we went live, I, I said to Kev that there's been a few battles going into this game. We had Celtic versus the SFA, Celtic versus Rangers when it came down to ticket allocations, Celtic versus the Green Brigades in relation to the women's games coming up. We'll be talking about that during the week, I'm sure. And of course, today's game. Celtic versus Livingston, and the team has been announced, and we're going to run through that for this big game. Probably, well, absolutely, it will be the, the last game we play at a stadium called the Spaghetti Had, because that sponsorship deal ends at the end of the season. And I've been saying all season, uh, all, all week rather, uh, around the likelihood of Livingston being relegated and the chances of them actually getting back into this league for a while, I think are very, very slim. Joe Hart is in goals today, um, 36 years of age. He's the oldest man on the park, Kev. Uh, this is going to be his 144th appearance. I'm going to come back to you and ask you the question whether or not, if you look throughout the whole season and the consistency element and not losing your form and not losing your place, should he be considered for player of the year? I'll come back to you on that one. Um, right back, Alistair Johnston. Left back, Greg Taylor. And the central defensive partnership is Liam Scales and Carter Vickers. Delighted to see Carter Vickers back. There was loads of discussion around whether or not he'd be risked on this plastic pitch. And, and Liam Scales is back as well. Tomoki Awata keeps his jersey. Does he deserve it? Let us know in the comment section. Bernardo's on the bench. Matt O'Reilly and Rio Hatati. The big one, the big return for Rio. I think we're just one uh, missing now, and that's the captain. Hopefully he'll be back for Ibrox. Nicholas Kuhn on the right, Dyson Maid on the left, and Kyogo Furuhashi through the middle. On the bench, we've got Scott Bain, Adam Ida, Yang returns from his suspension. Novroski is back on the bench with uh, Bernardo, Kelly, Forrest, Ralston, and Welsh. So no place on the bench for Rocco Vata. What's your thoughts on the lineup, first and foremost, Kev? It's a very, very strong lineup, isn't it? This is us getting back to that pretty much full strength. First pick in every position. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's ideal. I, I was looking at this before, and I know James had put out a blog during the week about the players that were returning from injury, Carter Vickers, McGregor, Hatati, and who would you play them? And I was a little bit uh, on the cautious side, and I've, mm -hmm. I went back and said, I don't think I would play any of them, just given the surface. 
you know, Carter Vickers is coming back from injury. We've risked him too early before in aggravated injuries. It's a difficult surface. You don't want to do that. Same with Rio. No idea how far along he is in his recovery. I, I wasn't at the time and thought, nah, I just wouldn't do it. And McGregor, there was always the view that he wasn't going to play. But when I seen the team this morning, and I've got to admit, there was a big smile on my face when I've seen the Carter Vickers and Hatate are in there because yeah. that's what they do. That's what they bring. You know, you look at that defence and it doesn't matter who plays alongside Carter Vickers. If it's Carter Vickers plus A and other, you're confident because you've got the big man. You I call know it the he's Van Dyke every yeah. ball that's in there. Yeah. Yeah, you could. You could give it that. You know, it just gives you that confidence. And players, I think, grow those extra few inches because he's next to them. Mm-hmm. And then, it's like when I'm in, in the match field, in the UK, it just fills me with this confidence, you know, that everything's uh, going well, to be all right. Say, but, uh, it's not that you grow the few extra inches, it's that I'm that small that it makes you look bigger. That's what it is. <laughs> Ah, well, did you see me on Monday's yeah. Wonder with Big Ewan? Um, obviously, I was short of a few yeah. inches there as well. Um, <laughs> but yes, I'm sorry to interrupt. Don't you go. Oh, you're quite all right. Uh, but yes, so we're with, with, with Rio coming back in the midfield. I mean, we've been crying out for that creative player all season because it seems like he's been missing for pretty much the entire season. Uh, and he just gives you again that confidence that if the game's not quite going our way, We've got someone in the midfield who can just unlock a defence with one pass. If uh, if Carter Vickers has got that Van Dijk thing about him, hatati has got a bit of the Moravchik's in that respect. Yeah. He just knew that Moravchik could unlock a defence and Hatati can do it. And to be fair, you know, I'm thinking, don't start them. Maybe bring them on for the final half an hour. Trust in the others to get the game done. Brendan's gone the other way. He's gone bold. I think he's gone, let's get the game won in the first hour. Let Hatati do his stuff in that 60 minutes, get the game won, get him off, then rest him up, wrap him in cotton wool and have him fine for that game next week. Yeah, absolutely. Every single point there. And I'm really um, keen to get the, the comments of all the listeners coming in 600 strong in the pre-match. Uh, first of all, love hearing where you're tuning into Axon from, from all parts of the globe. And today we've got John McVeigh coming from uh, Thailand. I hope you... Uh, Enjoy the game, John. I really do. Tell us, how do you watch the game? Is it just sitting in your, your pad on a on a device or do you find somewhere to go that actually shows the game? That would be interesting to know. Um, I was saying before, Joe Hart, let's run through the, uh, the team then. Joe Hart, is he a contender for player of the year? I, I, I mean, where I'm coming from here, Kevin, I've been saying this all season, I think that there has been a very subtle change to Joe Hart's game under Brendan Rodgers. Um, when he played under Ange, I thought he was brilliant, but every single game, it felt as though there was a mistake in him, but the mistakes were due to the fact that he had the ball at his feet so often. You look at the uh, the passing heat map, and it was all between the goalie and the two centre halves. He had a lot of the ball. I think now the onus has been on uh, him basically just being a keeper, save the shots, lead from the back, and um, I think he's done that. I know a lot of people aren't happy with his command of the area, for example, we do lose a lot of goals from set plays. Um, sometimes he punches the ball. I'm not sure if he's trying to start an attack rather than catch the ball. But I think over the piece, this has been his most consistent season. And then when you look at the top players that we've got, um, Matt O'Reilly, for me, in, in terms of an outfield player, has been over the piece our best player. Kyogo um, has had a stop-start season. Rio, through injury, stop-start season. Even Callum McGregor has been in and out due to injury. I think in terms of consistency, uh, and Carter Vickers is the other one uh, with his injuries. Joe Hart, for me, if you're looking at consistency, I would vote for him. And it's not, you know, I'm not looking at it saying, oh, you know, he's retiring and it's sentimental. I think based on performances and consistency, Joe Hart's my player of the year, Kev. That is low-key a very strong argument you've just made there. It's completely out of left field, I think, when you look at normally who player of the year are. Uh, and this doesn't just go for Celtic, this goes for like when you get the Ballon d'Ors and World Footballer of the Year and all that. It's very rarely a defender or defensive-minded player that wins those awards because the forwards get all the attention. Now, you mentioned Matt O'Reilly, and I think he's been really good all season, but I was checking back in some of his stats just before coming on. He's got one goal in the last 10 games, he's got two goals in his last 16 for us. Performance-wise, I think he's been really good, but that uh, attacking output hasn't quite been there at the levels consistently throughout the season. That word is the one that you used a few times with Joe Hart. He has been consistent this season. Yeah. I think maybe we've lost a couple of soft goals that you could label in 
uh, at his door. But you're going to get that regardless of your keeper throughout the season. There will be games if hopefully when we win the league this season. You know, let's be confident and say when. If you were to do a proper review of the season and go back game by game, there'll be at least five, six, seven games in this season when Joe Hart has made big saves at big, big moments. You know, one of them that we've talked about quite a lot is the one at St Johnston. It's 2-1, 92nd minute or whatever it is. Joe Hart saves a shot on the line. We go down the park and make it 3-1. Mm -hmm. It's the difference between one point or three points. And he's done that a few times. He has actually been incredibly consistent. And it just gets uh, overlooked because you talk about the goals scored rather than the goals saved. A bit like Alan's point, I think, during the week there with the... The penalty decisions, you don't always look at the ones not given. They're equally as important as the ones that are given. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think Johar has been very consistent, very impressive this season. I don't know if I'd make him a player of the year because I do have the, this unconscious bias <laughs> towards the guys who scored the goals. And I would be tempted, if we win the league, give it to Kyogo because he scored two big goals this season, two match winners against Rangers. So far. <laughs> so far <laughs> potentially a third to come next week um but yeah he's, he's definitely up there joe hart and it isn't a what would you say like uh, trying to be be nice give him a farewell parting gift because it's his last season it's because he has been consistently pretty good this campaign no he has um and again maybe left field i'm just looking more at the consistency aspect i didn't realize O'Reilly's attacking output had uh, diminished so much over the last 16 games. We'll come back to him in a minute. I mean, Alistair Johnson, when you're looking at uh, his performances, I think that he's been up and down a wee bit. He's had a few injuries as well, you've got to remember. Um, and uh, I, I do think that he's back to his best. Se uh, left back, Greg Taylor is second only to Matt O'Reilly when it comes to assists in on the park. He has got 25 assists in his Celtic career. He's played 163 games. This will be his 164th. He's one of just a handful, actually, who have played over 100 games for Celtic on the park. And I think when Brennan Rodgers talks about um, it being a young side, it doesn't always mean young in years. I mean, young in terms of the group um, actually being together. And uh, that was the same when we, we spoke about the Lisbon Lions. People talk about uh, not wanting the Lisbon Lions to get old. And again, it was more of a, a case of getting stagnant because people would point out, if you look at the 6-17 in terms of the average age, it wasn't much different from them to Milan team. But, you know, w when you think about the actual age of a side, it's not the individual um, age of the players. It's more of how long they're together, how often you should refresh that. And Greg Taylor, 25 assists. We've got Liam Scales coming back in. This is his 50th appearance today uh, for Celtic. I'm glad that he's back in. Um, but at the same time, I'm looking at the bench and I'm thinking no, Broshke, it would nice to it would be nice to see him getting some minutes today. Uh, there are two centre halves on the bench, and of course, Carter Vickers, we're now calling it the Van Dyke effect. You put him in and he makes his partner um look a lot, lot better. And I think also with, with Carter Vickers, and there's still some comments in the in the comment section coming through saying this, Kev, there was a few um concerns about his fitness and this surface. I think the fact that he starts, he's in, he starts, he's the captain. It just means Rodgers is looking at this going, you know what, we need to win every game. This isn't just about Ibrox. We need to win every game this season to win this league. So he's getting the big guns out, isn't he? Yeah, he's uh, he's treating this game like the Rangers game, or with the same respect. Um, and I'll, if you, you, you've called it the Van Dyke effect, I'll go, it's even the Callum McGregor effect of having Carter Vickers in for this game. Thinking back to... The 3 nothing game in uh, the first lockout match at Celtic Park. You know, McGregor had been out injured for the, a few weeks prior to that match. And the lift that he gave everyone when you saw his name on the team sheet kind of spurred us along. The fans, you know, the, the atmosphere went up an extra 10%. It was electric anyway. And then McGregor was in. It just rose yeah. even more. Yeah. And I don't know if it's just me, if I'm just excited about this or not, but, like, I'm... Far more buzzing about this game now that Carter Vickers is in because I've got to think if you're looking at it sensibly, we've rushed him back two times already this season and then he's been out for two or three weeks. There's no way we should be taking that risk again with what's coming up next week. So I've got to think he's 100% fit and ready to go. And if he is, then that's fantastic. Going into the final 
what would it be eight games of the season or whatever it is you know you need players like that back fully firing um, and it gives us all that big boost in confidence to see him in there no you're right i mean even this morning you see the the team list being announced to start in 11 i'm always waiting on that uh, graphic coming out so we can share it and say listen come and join us half an hour before kickoff and the fact that Hattati's pictures on it. You don't even look at the lineup. You just know Hattati's starting. And that's giving everybody a boost. Yes. You, you can see it. That, you know, there's a lot wrong with social media, Kev. We all know that. And I'm going to get to that in a wee second because Dominic is right. Alan does have the other mob raging big time. Um, there's a lot wrong with social media. But in terms of trying to gauge a mood, and you see it on the WhatsApp groups that you're involved in as well, as soon as you noticed Hattati starting today, the whole thing just raised. You know what I mean? You could just feel the energy. Yep. So um, if that's what he's doing to us, he's going to be doing that, obviously, to uh, his teammates. They're, they're going to be delighted that he's back. But then I think there's the opposite effect when David Martindale sees that graphic or sees the team line maybe five minutes mm -hmm. before we do. And then there's that moment of, well, wait a minute, the playmaker's back, you know? So um, massive, massive impact. And I hope that he makes a massive impact today. Come on, Celtic, simply says uh, Chill Pill. Absolutely. Um, and we've got Donny Tiny Hands back in. Why two centre backs on the bench? I think it's due to the Carter Vickers uh, worries, uh, you know, with, with regards to his injuries and the surface, but also the fact, Kev, that Liam Scales is just coming back from injury. So I, I just think you need a wee bit of insurance here. And I know it's to the detriment of Rocco Vata, who's not on the bench. But again, you could make the same argument. If Vata was on the bench, I've got three right wingers. So I get what you mean, Donny, but I think it's just because. We need a wee bit of insurance for the two guys that have started. David Boyle, let's pray Hattati does not break down. No McGregor, will he be fit for the derby? Yes, I think he will. I think he will be fit for the derby. Um, I, you know, when we were live on Friday, the news that McGregor wasn't in the training photos up at Lennox Town started filtering into the comments, Kev. So you kind of thought at that stage, right, McGregor's out. Um, but if he's out, because you kind of expected him to be involved, then he looks far more likely to be starting at Ibrox. And I had a conversation yesterday um, around whether or not you throw him in. Ah, you do. He's one of the guys in that squad I would not have a hesitation. Even if he'd been out for a while, like, I mean, he's been out since halftime against Dundee, the 7-1 game. If he'd been out for a couple of months, I wouldn't have a hesitation, Kev, of throwing him in in a big game in the Cup semi-final or final, European game or against Rangers. Because he's that type of player, I just think, that it wouldn't affect him. No, he's he's a club captain. So if he's fit, we play him. I think it's basically how it goes. Um, and like the game I was referencing before, the game under Ange, where we beat them three nothing at home, but it's all fully Celtic fans in the stadium. McGregor had missed a month or so beforehand, and he came straight back in and played that game. And like I said, the the boost that that gave everyone was incredible. Mm -hmm. You do it again if you've got a fit Callum McGregor. 75, 80% fit even, I think you put him into that game because these are the games that he thrives in. You miss him when he's not there. You can get away with it, I'm sure, in certain domestic games, and I'm hoping this is one of them, that we can get away without him because you've got Iwata and he will just kind of control and be that defensive pivot that you need in the midfield and obviously having Rio back helps. But um, if you've got the chance to play your captain, you play your captain. He's going to put his foot in the ball at Ibrox. He'll dictate the tempo when, when he's on the ball. He'll drive us forward. He's done it so many times in that game and at that venue uh, where he's just he's taken the game by the scruff of the neck. He's been the one that's taken the ball and taken us 20, 30 yards forward up the park and made something happen. He's a big game player. It's a big game. So, of course, you'd, you'd throw him back in if he's available to play. And I think you'd mentioned that before he really wanted to play at Tynecastle. That's right. So he's been itching to play mm -hmm. since he's gone out. So yeah, I think uh, I think we've done the right thing today. Just keep him out for that extra week. Don't aggravate the injury any further. And I'm pretty sure he'll be back for next weekend. No, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be looking at the rest of the squad, but just going back to what Dominic was saying in relation to Alan, uh, you are referring, of course, to the uh, Friday night special that Alan Morrison and I put out on the Axon channel. Check it out on the YouTube. Uh, we focused on the refereeing in Scotland. It wasn't just uh, focusing on refereeing decisions against Celtic. Um, it was indeed looking across the entire division and what you get on talking of division what you get on social media is um you get a lot of noise dominic a lot of noise and um it's very 
I feel that social media, if you're having a discussion, there is no nuance. There, there is no nuance whatsoever. You can't actually get a point across if the person who is involved in the discussion doesn't want to hear what you're offering, Dominic. And it's the same old story with regards to the, the Rangers fan base who think that, you know, coming on and, and shouting moon howler and, and ambulance chaser and everything else, Kev, uh, wins them an argument of some description or someone else coming on and listing random statistics uh, with absolutely no bearing on the discussion that we had um, wins them some kind of argument. It's like the ones who, on the subject of liquidation and the same club myth, start uh, reeling off Pacific Shelf gifts. And uh, I sometimes wonder, is there a, a handbook for the gullibles or something, Kev? At some point, is it handed out from one of the forums or one of the podcasts where everybody needs to know a script because all use the same language? It's like everybody's got that annoying pal on Facebook, right, who's part of some kind of pyramid selling scheme. And they all instantly start speaking the same way when they're trying to sell you, a, a, I don't know, a candle or something, you know what I mean? Or some shake that's going to change your life in 90 days. Or, you know, some Texas ranch you need to go to, but it costs you five grand and you hand your mobile phone in at the door. Everybody's got that mad pal on Facebook, right? Where they just start scripting all this nonsense. It's like they've been brainwashed. That's the Rangers fan base when it comes to the same club myth and when it comes to refereeing in Scotland, Kev. Would you agree with that? Do you have one of their pals on Facebook? Oh, I no doubt do. I think I do. Oh, my wife certainly does, and I just uh, I'll ignore them all because it's not a platform I use very often. But uh, the only thing I would disagree with you on there is the fact that you said that brainwashed. They need to have a brain for it to be washed in the first place. You know, when yeah. they, when you see some of the nonsense that they come out with, like it's um, it's ridiculous. It's the ones where if you put out any sort of blog or post on on the social media. Someone will hit back straight away because of what the title is, but they haven't read the article, they haven't gone into the content of it. People will see that this is uh, that podcast from Alan, which is superb. It's one of the best that's probably gone out on any platform, not just Axel. That, that, that's credit to Alan. That's credit to Alan. I yes. would agree with that. 100% credit goes to him because it's all his work, really. Um, but yeah, people will just see it. See it's gone out on a Celtic platform, so it's obviously biased in our favour. They've not taken the time to listen to it. Alan actually went to pain throughout the whole thing to say he didn't want to produce it or put it out himself and certainly not on a Celtic platform because it, it does, in a sense, devalue the message because of where it's coming from because you will get the idiots that just jump on it and say it's biased, it's everything's doing green tinted specs. Listen to what he's got to say. It's all data, it's numbers, there's patterns, there's facts. It's not a random sample over five or six games. He goes back over a hundred games. He goes back over seasons worth of data. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got these, uh, you know, when he pulls out, Rangers get penalties at uh, was it eight standard deviations above the norm, which is incredible. For someone that's got a very basic understanding of statistics, that's insane, you know, uh, that it would be that high. It's just, it's such an outlier. And then, yeah, and, and he presents it in such a way that you just, it's irrefutable evidence that's there. So clearly anyone that does have an issue with it hasn't listened to it or just doesn't want to hear the truth that's, that he's telling. I know. And they probably, the data's telling. It's not even Alan that's telling it. It's not his it, made-up right. opinion. It's the data tells the story. 100%. Yes. 100%. I, I think the one that really blew my mind was um, it takes you 300 and this is, off the top of my head, I'd need to check the graph. 372 visits into their box against Rangers to get a penalty when the average is 170. And I think when you look at it, I go, right, okay. And I remember a pundit, a very well-paid pundit on a top you know, level broadcaster being asked the question about why Rangers went for almost a world record period of time without conceding a penalty domestically, Kev. And the, and the answer was, oh, we're very good at defending. Wow. You know, talk about subjective, talk about bias. This is Alan saying, no, actually, you know, when you look at Celtic and Rangers and you look at it in terms of they are the two dominant teams in Scottish football and they have been over the, the period of time that, that this data is from, then you would expect both teams largely to have similar possession, right? Because they're going to dominate most of the games until they come up against each other. And then, you know, a similar period of the game in the, the final third of the park a similar period of the game in the opposition's box. Yet, when you look at the actual 
it, it's night and day when you look at the figures. So it takes 372 um, visits to the Ibrox or, or to the Rangers box to get a penalty, whereas you know Celtic's just about on the average, and the average was way down at 170 odd. It's just frightening. And when you see it in charts and graphs, these these people who don't want to see the truth will come up with anything to try and dispel the fact that there is an issue. Jungle Lion, great to see you as always. Great to get some minutes in Hatate and CCD's legs. I think that we're all of the, the view that if uh, everything is going to plan after about an hour, you get them off. You absolutely get them off. When you look at the midfield then, Tomoki Awata retains his place. Matt O'Reilly and the man Rio Atate. Now, both Awata and Atate are 26 years of age, Kev. Matt O'Reilly is the youngest player in a Celtic jersey on that park. 23. You sometimes forget that he is, you know, still mm. down there in, in that, that bracket in terms of the age profile. Um, today will be his 112th appearance. He has 19 goals for Celtic, 31 assists. Will they get in amongst the uh, offensive stats today, do you think? You were pointing out there that in the last 16 games, he's not been as prolific. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll go back and that one. That's, that surprised me as well, to be fair. Like, I knew he'd, he'd kind of dropped off in his goals. I didn't realise it was kind of quite as bad as that. But I think he does cover for it by the fact that he is in there with the assists. Um, I think he's a fantastic player. You know, I've got so much time for Matt O'Reilly. I could sit and watch a highlight reel of him just on repeat all day. I think he's, I think he's brilliant. Um and today, why not? You know, he's definitely he's a game changer. He's got that ability in him. He, he can score goals. He was doing it at the start of the season at a fairly high rate. His uh, his assists, I didn't check that, but I'm pretty sure they'll have been quite consistent throughout the season because I don't think you get the numbers that he's got without being consistent in that respect. So, yeah, I'm looking, looking at him as being one of those guys that can win us this game. And... Pretty happy to see that he only got half an hour of football in the international break as well. There was a, the last half hour against the Pharaohs because I think he was looking a bit jaded before. So I was looking for him to get as much of a rest as he could. Half an hour in the final game, keeps him ticking over, brings him back nice and fresh for today. So why not get in amongst the goals? I'd love to see it, Kev. Um, I think that the very fact that you've got a water in there um, is a good thing for the likes of Hatati and O'Reilly because we're talking about having the insurance uh, or has, having someone on the bench for you. I think it's the same when you've got mm -hmm. offensive players in that midfield to have a water behind you. It breaks up the play really, really well. By the way, when we're talking about the Van Dijk effect, I'm not comparing Carter Vickers to Van Dijk. Kev, I'm sure you're not comparing Haksabanovic to Berbatov or, or Lubo Maravci <laughs> to, to Rio. I was, I was deadly serious about that one, Paul, and you know it. <laughs> but when I'm looking at Awata, he does that thing that Lenny used to do so well in the midfield for Celtic. He breaks up attacks. Or, you know, He does the, the kind of heavy carrying for the midfield. He does all that yeah. stuff that isn't going to be in a, in a show reel. It's not going to be you know in the highlights package, um, but it's very, very important. He's just there. He's always there to break up attack, block, challenges. He's very good at it. Uh, look out for it today if you haven't done so already. And it's a, an underappreciated same... role, isn't it? It is, yes. I was just going to say, it's the same then as you go back to Joe Hart, if you circle it back. He's, he's been so um, consistent because he's just been making saves this season. And folks will go, he's a goalkeeper, that's his job. Yeah. So that's why it doesn't get highlighted. Iwat as a defensive midfielder, he breaks up the play and then he gives it to someone who can play. So he's only doing his job. He's just incredibly good at doing his job, though, which is what yeah. makes him stand out. And he has such a great insurance to have. I um, mean, you've got somebody like the return of Rio in front of him and O'Reilly there as well. It just it allows them so much freedom to just go and play and attack and do what they do best. Yeah, you're right. We've got, obviously, Maeda, the ginger ninja. I think it was meant to be peroxide, but it's gone a bit ski with. Um, top goal scorer Kyogo Furuhashi looking for um, his 70th goal today in uh, Celtic jersey and then of course Nicholas Kuhn there was discussion around whether Yang would come back he was getting talked up by the gaffer I think that was uh, good management actually by Brendan Rodgers but Kuhn keeps his jersey and, and rightly so because he's been on good form hasn't he? Yeah he has I think he's been uh, over the, the couple of games before the break I thought he was probably our best player uh, over the piece with them so great to see him keeping his place. Um, it's good to see that he's 
he'd, he'd maybe just nice seems settled within the team, which is what he needed, just a few games to get in. And we're seeing the player that hopefully you know, Rogers saw in him to sign him and spend three million. But he looks a, a really good offensive player. And it is good management to tell a player that's coming back from suspension, you know, you were also on top form and but look at the guy that's in front of you. Mm-hmm. So in fact for him, look at the guy that's in the bench now. You know, there's yeah. two players on form fighting for that same position. Kuhn's got to keep those levels up to keep his uh, keep his place in the team. You're right. Now, if the the moment comes, Kev, where AI generates our avatars and our names when we appear online, I think this would be mine. It's the slabber and cabbage. And he reckons oh. 7-1 for Celtic. Why not? We've, had, we've seen it already this season. Listen, thank you, everybody, for getting involved on this Easter Sunday. Get stuck into your old uh, Cadbury's cream eggs and enjoy the first half. Join Kevin and I at half time. Hopefully, we'll be talking about a free scoring first half of football for Celtic. Uh, thanks, everybody, for getting involved. And thank you to Kevin McCluskey for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. <laughs>